My talk today is titled, John Thomas Looney's Difficult Task. Mr. Looney's goal in writing Shakespeare Identified was to establish Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, as the real author of the literary works long believed to have been written by William Shakespeare of Stratford-on-Avon. Now, if Shakespeare's works had been newly discovered with no author's name on them, it would have been a rather simple matter to convince others that Edward de Vere had written them. Looney's evidence matching the man with the works, linking Edward de Vere with Hamlet, All's Well That Ends Well, the sonnets, and so on, is so strong that just about everybody would have been convinced. But that was not the task that Looney faced. He had to convince people that works already attributed to William Shakespeare for more than 300 years had really been written by somebody else. That was a far harder task because it's much harder to break the mold break the hold of an existing belief and replace it with a new one than merely to introduce a new one. It was the pre-existing belief that was the problem, the factor that made Looney's task so difficult. He knew he faced an uphill battle, but he believed he was well prepared for it because of the extensive multifaceted nature of the evidence he had accumulated and presented in Shakespeare Identified. And yet the battle was far harder than he expected. It was not easy for most of the first readers of Shakespeare Identified to accept Edward de Vere as Shakespeare. They were perplexed, unsure how seriously to take the idea. The attitude of many critics and reviewers was that although the evidence Looney presented seemed valid, there must be a flaw in it somewhere, even if they couldn't quite see what it was. Any idea that clashed so completely with what everybody already knew couldn't possibly be true, could it? There were in fact three levels of resistance that made it so difficult for so many to accept the Oxfordian answer to the Shakespeare mystery. The human resistance, the cognitive resistance, and the institutional resistance, three levels. So this talk could have been titled John Thomas Looney's Difficult Tasks, plural not merely Looney's difficult task. The situation was actually much more complicated than this simple scenario of three levels suggests, but for the purpose of this rather short talk, a degree of simplification is necessary. Now, much of the information for this talk comes from a book I have been working on for several years, and that is nearing completion. So I'd like to tell you a bit about that book before examining the three levels of resistance. John Thomas Looney's Shakespeare Identified, the 100th anniversary of the book that is revolutionizing Shakespeare studies is the title. I don't have a cover yet, but here are mock-ups of two ideas for it. If this was a live presentation, I'd ask for your preferences between them. I'm now leaning toward the one on the right, the one with the, light, the lighter colored background. By the time this book is released next spring, I will have put five years into researching it and one year into writing it. So six years work will have gone into it. Six years of my life. Most of the book focuses on the first 25 years of the Oxfordian era, 1920 to 1945. It's in five main parts with 18 chapters. Part one recounts John Thomas Looney's investigations into the authorship question and his presentation of his findings in Shakespeare Identified. It also presents the initial response to it by reviewers and critics and his replies to them. Much of my talk today will be drawn from chapter five, the dozen mental revolutions from part one of the book. Part two describes the uh, rise of the Oxfordian movement, the founding of the Shakespeare Fellowship, and the activities and publications of Oxfordian scholars through the mid 1930s. Part three examines the Stratfordian response to the Oxfordian challenge. And part four recounts the public battle between Oxfordians and Stratfordians as it played out in the public media in the 1930s and the first half of the 1940s. And in part five, I step back for some analysis. In chapter 16, I examine why it matters who wrote Shakespeare's works. In 17, I compare the state of the Oxfordian movement today with that at the end of the 1930s, 80 years ago. And in the final chapter, I present lessons learned from the first generations of Oxfordians that might be useful for those of us today working to complete the Oxfordian revolution that Looney launched 100 years ago.
Before returning to the three levels of resistance, let's review the two stories so that they are clearly in mind when we examine the resistance to the new one. In the traditional story, a young man from Stratford with no known education, someone who speaks a dialect of English not understood outside his native area, goes to London where through dint of his own native genius, he soon writes two lengthy poems in the most sophisticated London English and then follows them up with plays showing intimate knowledge of politics, diplomacy, and courtly pursuits, and revealing great familiarity with the law in Italy, all without leaving behind a single trace of how he acquired any of that knowledge. He was uninvolved with the publication of his works, and at age 41 to 48, so the story goes, he abandoned his career to return to Stratford to engage in small-time commercial transactions for the rest of his life. In Mr. Looney's story, the author was one of the most highly educated people of his time, and as the highest ranking Earl in the kingdom, he was someone intimately involved with the Queen, the court, and the political and diplomatic events of his time. He had traveled extensively in Italy and France, and had written works acclaimed by his contemporaries as the best by courtly poets and dramatists. He was deeply involved with the publication of Shakespeare's works, which ceased in 1604, the year of his death. The result of these two stories are, on one hand, literary works that are, in effect, floating freely in space with no connection to the uh, life of the man who supposedly wrote them or to his times. And on the other hand, literary works that are deeply personal portrayals of events and people important in the life of Edward de Vere and of the political and diplomatic events of his times. On the one hand, the works are the products of fantasy and genius, and on the other, they are the products of concrete realities, imaginatively recreated by genius. On the one hand, we have Ralph Waldo Emerson, who spoke for many in saying that he could not marry Shakespeare's life to his verse. And on the other hand, Canon Gerald H. Rendell, one of the founders of the University of Liverpool, who observed that the plays reveal numerous and arresting coincidences with recorded events and traits in the career of Edward de Vere. Okay, back to the three levels of, of uh, resistance. The first level of resistance, the human resistance is common to all people. It's simply the natural human resistance to changing any long held belief. It's easier to go straight ahead than to turn and especially to do a U-turn. Walter Badgett, the prominent British economist and critic, someone Looney quoted in Shakespeare Identified, realized that unbelief far oftener needs a reason and requires an effort than belief. The human mind, he recognized, does not treat new ideas neutrally. Most people's first impulse is to reject new ideas that contradict beliefs already held. It's also from Badgett that we have the phrase, the cake of custom, that he used when applying that first insight about individuals to society as a whole. After surveying the development of human societies over all of recorded history, Badgett concluded that the great difficulty which history records is not that of the first step, but of the second step. What is most evident is not the difficulty of getting a fixed law, but of getting out of a fixed law, not of cementing a cake of custom, but of breaking the cake of custom. So the first level of resistance to the Oxfordian idea incorporates both individual and social aspects of human psychology. The second level is cognitive resistance. This type of resistance arises from the need to change the specific beliefs involved in the subject of Shakespearean authorship. There are two parts to it. <clears throat> One arises from the complexities of the Oxfordian claim itself and the other from the consequences that flow from that claim. The weight of the combination of the two, of the complexities and the consequences, is so heavy that it's hard for the human mind to process it all, at least within a short span of time. The mind wants to shut down when faced with such difficulties. It's unable to move forward, just like in the image, the weight of the cart is so heavy that the donkey cannot move forward. For the donkey, many trips carrying smaller loads will be necessary, and that takes time. For most people, dipping into the Oxfordian claim many times will be necessary to absorb it and the consequences that flow from it 
And that too takes time. Looney knew that acceptance of the Oxfordian thesis would not be easy or instantaneous. He commented on several, on several occasions that readers would need to make an effort to understand it. Everything depends, he wrote, on the willingness of the reader to familiarize himself with all the particulars and by a mental effort of his own to bring them together so as to judge their total weight as evidence. This requires time and an open mind. And then there are the, hid the hidden consequences of the Oxfordian claim. That is, consequences that for most first-time readers of Shakespeare identified were not immediately apparent. The more they thought through the Oxfordian claim, though, the more complicated it became. They began to see that it was not a matter of simply plucking one man out and putting another in his place. Making the change in that one overarching belief in who the author was leads logically and inevitably to overthrowing another dozen major beliefs and these in turn lead to changes in more than 50 other subsidiary beliefs. These beliefs all hang together as a coherent package. You can't choose which ones to change. It's all or nothing at all. It's like the old advertisement for Lay's potato chips. You can't eat just one. The cognitive resistance, the shutting down of the brain, comes when the number of beliefs to be changed suddenly seems overwhelming. Considering them all en masse, uh, is more than the mind can handle, at least in a short period of time. So it's much simpler to back up and reject the change in that one overarching belief than it would be to have to engage in the mental effort to change 12 other big beliefs and 50 subsidiary beliefs. The dozen major beliefs that have to be changed if one accepts the change in author are each so substantial that I call them mental revolutions. Here's a quick look at the dozen uh, mental revolutions and the 50 subsidiary beliefs that flow from them that all must be changed. The font here might be too small to read, but the purpose of this slide is just to give you a sense of the number of beliefs to be changed flowing from that one initial change in author. So it's no wonder so many people balked at accepting the Oxfordian claim upon their first hearing of it. Let's look at some of the some examples of the mental revolutions and the subsidiary beliefs that have to be changed. Mental revolution number two concerns the external conditions in which Shakespeare's plays were written. Two of the subsidiary beliefs concern the venues for which they were written and when. In the old Stratfordian view, as expressed by Sir Sidney Lee, the plays were written for the public theaters. In the new Oxfordian view, the plays were written for performances in the court and in private theaters. Only later were they performed in public theaters. In the Oxfordian view, the plays were written roughly 15 years earlier than in the Stratfordian. Mental revolution number four concerns chains of influence on Shakespeare. And one of the subsidiary beliefs concerns the influence on Shakespeare of the dramatist John Lilly. But if Shakespeare's plays had been written 15 years earlier than had been supposed, then the order of the chain of influence must be reversed. In the Stratfordian view, as expressed by Sir Sidney Lee, Shakespeare profited by the lessons which these men were teaching. Lilly in comedy and Marlowe in tragedy may be reckoned the masters to whom he stood in the relation of disciple on the threshold of his career. In the Oxfordian view, as expressed by Mr. Looney, the dramas of Edward de Vere form the source from which sprang Lilly's dramatic conceptions and enterprises. Lilly and his work constitute a most important link in the chain of evidence connecting the work of Shakespeare with the Earl of Oxford. Only under the influence of the Stratfordian theory, cause is mistaken for effect. Here's one of the subsidiary views uh, regarding the internal aspects of the plays. In the old view, as again expressed by Sir Sidney Lee, it is dangerous to read into Shakespeare's dramatic utterances allusions to his personal experience. An unquestioned characteristic of Shakespeare's art is its impersonality. In the new Oxfordian view, the plays and poems are intensely personal and topical. As Mr. Looney wrote, Shakespeare's work is much more a record of his own personal relationships than has hitherto been supposed. <clears throat> 
Shakespeare's characters are taken from his own experience of the men and women about him, actually living men and women, artistically modified and adjusted to fit them for the part they had to perform, are what may, we may be sure the plays contain. Continuing in the same vein, in the older view, Sir Edmund Chambers, perhaps the most respected traditional scholar of William Shakespeare and of the Elizabethan stage, agreed with Sir Sidney Lee that the plays were not topical. He believed that Shakespeare uh, does not seem to have been greatly given to topical illusions and the hunt for them is dangerous. Well, isn't it interesting that both Sir Sidney Lee and Sir Edmund Chambers used the word dangerous when referring to topical illusions? perhaps because it was dangerous for their blind belief in the man from Stratford. The Oxfordian view is that the plays were intensely topical. One study identified 433 topical illusions in Shakespeare's plays. Hamlet, with 50, heads the list. Of the 50 topical illusions in Hamlet just noted, 44 tie the play to the early 1580s rather than the later 1590s. These include allusions to preparations for the expected Spanish invasion, to act activities such as casting cannons, shipbuilding, and so on, needed for defense against the Spanish Armada. And then there is the allusion to magnetism. When Gertrude tells Hamlet, sit here, and he replies, no mother, here is metal more attractive, and then sits down next to Ophelia, the author is making a topical reference to a book on magnetism just published and that was the subject of discussion in court circles in the early 1580s. The larger point here though, is not that the literary works contain references to contemporary events of people, but that the connections work both ways. Yes, we can understand the plays better by knowing Elizabethan history at the time the plays were actually written, now that we know the correct dates, but perhaps even more important, scholars can learn much about the historical foreground about the Elizabethan era at the time the plays were originally written, once it is fully recognized just how extensively they commented on contemporaneous events. They really were the abstracts and brief chronicles of their times. Mental Revolutions 8 and 9 relate to the nature of genius and literary creativity. The Stratfordian view is that genius was like a magic wand. It can explain anything. As Sir Sidney Lee stated, the infinite difference between Shakespeare's endeavors and those of his fellows was due to the magical and involuntary workings of genius. The Oxfordian view brings the understanding of genius and literary creativity back into line with psychologists' usual understanding of them. As Looney explained, there is a frequent assumption that the possession of what we call genius renders its owner capable of doing almost anything. Now, William Shakespeare is the one and only stock illustration of this contention. In all other cases, where the whole of the circumstances are well known, we may connect the achievements of a genius with what may be called the external accidents of his life. Though social environment is not the source of genius, it certainly has always determined the forms in which the faculty has clothed itself. A vast disparity or incompatibility between the man and the work must always justify a measure of doubt as to the genuineness of his pretensions and make us cast about for a more likely agent. Mental revolution number 11 concerns Edward de Vere and his place in the times in which he lived. Accepting Oxford as Shakespeare gives us a fuller understanding of the man who wrote Shakespeare's plays. Like with the two-way relationship between the illusions in the plays and the history of the times, Information about the author's life helps us understand the plays better, and allusions in the plays help us understand Oxford's life, his experiences, and his personality more deeply. We see that he was not merely a courtier with poetic tendencies, as Sir Sidney Lee would have it, but someone who stood at the heart of the intellectual and literary and artistic life of the Elizabethan age. As Gerald Rendell wrote in a passage worth emphasizing, only later uh, only lately has it become plain how central a place belongs to Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, at the confluence of the various currents of literary activity, poetic, dramatic, exotic, and academic, which combine to form the product known as Elizabethan. Student, poet, playwright, and patron of the drama, he was in touch with the most versatile spirits of the age. 
and in the judgment of his best informed contemporaries, his own compositions were second to none in excellence. So Oxford was at the center of it all, connected to the Renaissance flowing in from Italy and France, where he had lived for more than a year, and at the forefront of the literary and linguistic revolutions taking place from the 1570s onwards. His is a truly fascinating story about one of the most important and most interesting human beings who ever lived, and we would not know much about it if not for John Thomas Looney. I hope this quick look at a few of the mental revolutions that had to be gone through and at some of the subsidiary beliefs that had to be changed for anyone to fully buy into the Oxfordian claim gives you some sense of just how overwhelming the number of changes was for someone encountering the Oxfordian thesis for the first time. And I hope it gives you a sense of the difference the change an author makes. Those that persevered in their efforts to understand it came away with deeper understandings of many subjects, including Shakespeare's plays and poems, the Elizabethan era, the nature of genius and literary creativity, and the nature of the true author and the central place he held in the times in which he lived. These subjects have been greatly misunderstood for over 400 years because Shakespeare has been misidentified. And now we turn to the third of the three levels of resistance the institutional resistance. Departments of literature within universities are not merely the places in which literary scholars work. They were institutions with institutional interests to be protected and resources that could be used to protect them. The leaders of those departments at the time considered Shakespeare identified and the Oxfordian claim to be threats to the status and interests of their institutions and they used the full range of their, of their powers to try to neutralize that threat. As one tactic, they ignored the Oxfordian challenge whenever possible. In the course of writing my book, I examined the works of the top 48 Shakespeare scholars of the 1920s and 1930s, and found that two thirds of them made no reference whatsoever to John Thomas Looney, Shakespeare identified, or the Oxfordian claim. The, re the remaining third mentioned the Oxfordian idea in passing before airily dismissing it as not worthy of serious attention. When scholars were forced to address the Oxfordian thesis, they continued to repeat old charges that Oxfordians had already rebutted without any mention of those rebuttals. They changed the subject. They presented distorted versions of the Oxfordian claim and then showed the ridiculousness of the distorted versions they had presented and they rejected the methodology of citing personal and topical allusions in the plays to Edward de Vere's life and personality and to other events and people important to him. The one thing that academia did not do was subject the Oxfordian claim to the sort of objective scholarly examination to which literary scholars subjected all other literary matters, or if they did, the results were never made public. I examined this subject of academia's response to the Oxfordian challenge in great detail in my book, devoting three chapters and more than 100 pages to it. And now to sum up, John Thomas Looney correctly identified Edward de Vere as the author of the works known as Shakespeare's. Over the first quarter century of the Oxfordian era, he and other Oxfordian scholars made great progress in convincing many people of De Vere's authorship. That is, they made great progress in overcoming the human resistance and the cognitive resistance to the idea of Edward De Vere's authorship. But they were not able to overcome the institutional resistance. The forces and resources arrayed against them within academia were too strong to be overcome before the Second World War shut down their efforts in 1939 in England. By the time the war ended, six years later, uh, in the second half of 1945, most of the most prominent Ox uh, members of the Oxfordian movement in England had died or withdrawn from active involvement in it because of old age. The situation was the same in the United States by the end of 1948. And so it remains up to us, to those of us active in the Oxfordian movement today, to continue the effort to complete the Oxfordian revolution that John Thomas Looney launched 100 years ago. Mm -hmm.